Okay, hi. So, um, I, I suppose I, I presented a, a talk over the summer of 2012 um, from a, a PhD that was finished at an international conference on learning over in, in London. I wanted to put up a, a review or, or, or a short maybe presentation just, just covering some of the slides um, to see if we can get some feedback from a wider, wider community. Um, so, so the talk was entitled A Framework for Adaptive E-Learning, Moving Towards a Generic Model. Um, the idea is that we're looking towards the, the future to see where e-learning can potentially go. And in, in my opinion, uh, at least, what way it, it should take in terms of a, a direction or, or a higher level view. Um, so, so briefly, the, the talk is, is going to really give you a, an overview of, of, of what was discussed. Uh, so I'm going to address the, the problem that e-learning currently faces uh, and then a solution that that was that has been developed um, consisting of two different components. So we have a content analyzer and a selection model and we, we go down through both of those components. Um, and then we're going to conclude with a, a short evaluation of, of, of exactly the, I suppose the the outputs from the content analyzer and the, and the selection model. Okay, so I, I suppose the the problem is is a global problem that we're looking at at the moment in in relation to higher education, and the number of people entering into higher education is massively expanding on a global scale, um, at the moment and certainly over the next twenty years. Um, in Ireland, currently the HEA are expecting Ireland to follow this, this global trend, um, but unfortunately are consolidating the, the third level sector and expecting the private education industry to pick up some of some of the excess students. Um, but, but this is a mass, massive problem, not only in Ireland, but, but around the world. Okay, so it costs big money to have people housed in traditional third level education facilities. E-learning is, is one such channel of education where we can see going forward it could be used as a viable platform for education. Um, and we're starting to see an awful lot of growth in this area. But again, it's a little bit unstructured, un unconnected, and probably not being addressed in an appropriate manner. Um, we, we have all the information in the world, but we just need to be able to harness that, that information. So, so where this project started with was was centered on the idea that is it possible to construct an automated learning component that generates instructional content suited to the cognitive ability and pedagogic preference of a learner independent of the main and ensuring that no meaning is lost from any adaptive strategies? So it, it's a bit of a, a tricky question because when, when you look at the terms cognitive ability and pedagogic preference, they mean slightly different things depending on who you're talking to. If you consider or have a discussion with a neuroscientist, well, cognitive ability is going to mean something slightly different than if you're talking to a, a psychologist or a computer scientist. So, so what this project took um, as a strategy well, was more of a, a computer scientist approach. Okay, So we kind of meet in the middle of the, the neuroscientist and the psychologist, as you'll see in a sec. Um, this this problem isn't a problem that's solely being looked at um, in Ireland. It's a problem that's you know is a global issue, and there are massive organisations doing some really great stuff um, around the world. And the ADL are, are one such organisation. Um, the Advanced Distributive Learning Initiative was set up in November of nineteen ninety seven, and what well, they had a, a similar goal. So they wanted to bring the highest quality instructional material tailored to the individual needs of anybody anywhere. Um, and and late, more lately, they've they've included things like on on any device, um, so th they're expanding out their out their goals. Now, and what the ADL have done is they've developed, uh, or one thing that they've done is they've developed a shareable content object reference model, which is a great idea, which is a a, a great thing from a, I suppose from a bird's eye view, but the unfortunate thing is that it, it's not being adopted properly. Um, some some of the latest um, research was found that only fifty seven people fifty seven percent of people that actually generate SCORM objects actually fill in keywords. So this whole concept of reuse is is simply being lost. Um, 
so I suppose for, from my perspective, it's a little bit disappointing that you have these standards, you have these large organizations that are spending lots of money, but still, you know, relying on an end user, relying on somebody to actually fill in some content. Now, we're, we're never going to truly get away from the reliance of, of an end party or an end um, individual, but we can help that process by having some automation. So I suppose one of the most frustrating things um, looking at this sector over the last number of years, um, we had the things like traditional adaptive hypermedia systems. Um, lots of examples. Uh, typically they're being built centered around a certain, to build certain domain competence. Um, and normally how it works is that as an author of the system, you would identify suitable paths throughout this instructional space and then depending on the learner's performance, they will be guided through this instructional space. The problem is that it's con completely constrained to the author of that system. Okay, you can imagine if, I, if I'm a, a certain, uh, if, I, if I'm a certain author of a, an adaptive media system, I have certain beliefs and goals around pedagogy, how people should learn, and what instruments they should go through for us. What should they master before proceeding onto the next topic? It, it's my perspective. We have millions of people in the world. We have loads of different learners. Learning can't be categorized or shelled into a few of these minimal traits. But we have to open that up to a much wider audience. Um, and there's no, there has been no widespread adoption, um, at, at least um, in the in the findings that I've had, in relation to adaptive hypermediums, um, adaptive hypermedia systems being scaled out across bigger and better systems. So. But what I wanted to do initially was to start off, at least from a, a starting point, to ensure that the learning component that was developed will be independent of domain. Okay, so it's it's not shoehorned into a mathematical area or computer science area. That it's independent of domain. It's independent of the author characteristics. So me as as the author of the learning component, that I'm not going to, you know, restrict the learning experience by of individuals. That it should be independent of of me or of, of other entities that will use the system. So we need to move out to a different kind of system. Um, we, we wanted it to be open so we could integrate into multiple content management systems or learner management systems. And it had to be fast, okay? So as, as a computer scientist, if I sit down to a web page or a website and if, if I click on a button to load something and if nothing happens, I'm gone, I'm out of there. So we wanted this to be light and fast, um, so, so really, really quick. Um, the biggest issue I found initially when, when looking at this, this this kind of project that there was too many inconsistencies in learning object repositories. So there are a number of repositories around the world um, and the inconsistencies were, were just were, were terrible. Um, the reuse of content just, just didn't exist. Um, so it brought other challenges to the issue. So and one of those challenges was, was centered around content. So it was decided that I would have to build a, a content analyzer. And what the content analyzer simply does is it takes in educational content. Um, we feed this into the content analyzer. The analyzer strips it of all of its, its formatting and it restructures the code as a shareable content objects. And it generates a new repository of shareable content objects. But in addition, to the, these shareable content objects that adhere to the latest um, standards from the ADL, it also generates a metadata file um, encoding, encoded in using XML that describes the cognitive resources found within that instructional content. And for, for the purposes of, of this talk and project, the cognitive resources are simply resources that are within the content that stimulate a cognitive response. Okay? So, it, it enables us to be able to redesign content by mining these metadata files to adapt to a learner's profile. Um, so as I said at the start, I mean, this, this framework that has been built took on a few um, cognitive abilities um, that, were, that were, I suppose, widely accepted out there um, in, in the real world. And it, what it did was it took those as examples 
um, of cognitive traits. The framework is built as an open framework, so we can plug in lots more stuff, and and it it evolves and and does its thing. But but some of the the traits that we took were from the cattle horn Carl um, um project, and we we looked at things like short term memory, long term storage and retrieval, reading writing abilities, visual spatial abilities. Now we we kind of we took these cognitive abilities, and we identified pseudometrics for them. But we looked at this in terms of what should exist there for an online environment. Because we, at the end of the day, when we look at these cognitive traits, we have to contextualize that against the actual learning environment that's taking place. We, we can't just have these floating around in, in different environments. So when we had our content analyzer up and working, the problem changes. Okay, so now, first of all, we had not enough content. We didn't have the proper content. There wasn't enough structure. There was inconsistencies. Now, with the content analyzer, we have a much bigger problem. Now, we have too much content. Okay, so when you have too much content that's fully encoded to identify these cognitive resources, the problem shifts and changes. And the problem changes to a much nicer computer science problem, which we, we call a selection model. Okay, and if you think about it like this, okay, so over on the left hand side here, we have a number of different factors that are being imported into the selection model, okay, into our repositories. And the selection model is an evolutionary strategy to recombine instructional content. What we pass in is, is a, a, a score, a numerical score associated with the minimum expected learning experience. The CT weights, these are the cognitive trait weights. So for the four um, elements that we had in there, we can re-engineer the weighting factors to modify and let's say if we take working memory capacity to be the single most important component, well we can multiply up the importance of that. And we can say we want this instructional content to evolve to suit the working memory capacity. We pass in the profile of the learner and the profile of the learner simply is calculated by having the learner complete a number of tests initially and this, this can be also automatically found by engaging with the system or through multiple interactions we can fine tune it but initially for the for the simple examinations we we had learners sit through a, a very simple set of, of exams to come up with their the metrics um, and also the, the course the last thing will be the course that the learners are are, um, are looking at when these are all fed into the selection model the selection model uses modified genetic algorithms to take little pieces of each of those little skulls or each of those little share of content objects to recombine them and to generate a new course and the idea behind it is that we would get happy learners at the end because we're automatically reconstructing these different learning objects suited to the ability of the student and we're not going to stop until we reach a predetermined minimum expected learning experience and the theory is we end up with loads of happy learners okay and, and the world is a better place so so what we did so we're still you know, very much early stages okay so what we did is we took 22 groups okay so we had 20 students participating in a traditional lecture in UML and eight students participated in an online class that was automatically designed for each student we had a, a repository built by various lectures um, that were given a module descriptor for this short course in UML. And then we fed all this content through the analyzer to automatically generate their, their local repository. Um, once the, the student had been through these different, different um, classes, um, we had two different examiners. And all the students completed a short test after they finished the course. So it's the same test that they had. The test was designed associated with the module descriptor that was given out to all of the lectures and, and indeed the lecturer who was given the traditional lecture. Um, the both examiners marked all of the scripts blind. Um, not with a blindfold, blind. They, they didn't know if a student had participated in the traditional lecture or if a student had participated in the online class. Um, and when, when it came back, the results showed that there was a 17% increase on average in individuals using the automated system. So 17% increase on average 
So some people were well above, some people below, but a 70% increase on average. Now, I, I suppose, um, be, being realistic about this, this experiment, um, further tests have to be completed to show um, how stable this, this kind of environment is or how stable this, this kind of method is. Um, so I, I suppose a lot more work to be done um, in relation to bringing in more traits um, and more resources, generate more metadata associated with those tests. Um, but, but it's a good starting point from, from our side and, and we can definitely say that it was, wasn't a negative experience. Um, and in communicating with the learners after, they were they were very much at ease with the system and the framework. Um, they they felt very comfortable in that environment, and with a seventy percent increase in in terms of a learning experience, it was it was a really positive um, output for us. Um, okay, th thanks for listening. At least at least that's my opinion of of where I think we we should be driving e-learning towards. Um, I think there's there's a lot of really cool things being done around the world, but I think we need to think just a little bit broader to try and encapsulate some of these really cool automatic strategies that can exist there. Now, if you have any questions, you can drop me a mail at kmaycock at ncrl.ie. Um, if you want to maybe join the project or, or feel like you have something to contribute, again, you can drop me a mail and we can we can see if it may be our if the synergies can exist between the two projects um okay listen um, thanks for thanks for listening and i hope it was enjoyable